Hello and welcome to episode 7 of our App Builder Creation video tutorials. If you've missed any of the videos, please do check out the playlist and go back. There's some really good stuff that you might want to catch up on. If you prefer, you can check out the code by following along on our GitHub page. That is in the Fission Tutorials project inside the Fine Labs um, organization. Check it out there and follow along. You'll see that we've tagged each of the episodes so you know where we got to at each of the videos in the playlist. In this video, we will begin work on a custom theme editor, starting with a theme switcher and then adding color pickers. We'll include the ability to preview the changes on the application that we're building and we'll see how we can build a custom widget to improve the color selection. Since last video, I have upgraded the library that we were using to handle the user interface serializing the encoding and decoding to JSON. And I have fixed the issue where file names weren't matching on the full extension. If we go back and look at the code, you can see here that the extensions are now matching on .gui.json and the code that I added is a pretty straightforward end of string check instead of just comparing the extension of the URI. You might also remember um, there was an error on the command line telling us that we weren't using an ID for our application. I glossed over it at the time. This is because we're using an unreleased version of the fine library and there was a great new feature added that remembers which type of panel people like for their file browsing and that uses preferences. I'll come back to preferences in the future, but for now we just needed to tell the new app constructor what our unique ID was, and that allows it to remember preferences across application launches. Before we start today, I also wanted to introduce one more piece of code uh, that we're not going to actually go into details of because it is not yet uh, released. I have this file here called unreleased.go and it contains set preview theme. This will be covered in a feature of Find 2.5, but because it's a work in progress, I didn't want to go into the details. So if you're curious, you can go have a look at the source code once we've published it. But for now, assume that this is quite happily going to call some fine APIs that will be released in a future version of the code. But let's get started. To support editing a theme, we're, well, we're first going to need a custom theme. We did make one before to define how our application should look, but this time we're going to want to make an editable one. So let's create a new custom theme, but this time inside the editors package. And I will create a new file uh, called editable theme. And uh, this is in the editor's package. Um, let's uh, give it a type which is editable theme, which is just a struct. And that is going to uh, encapsulate an existing theme so that we can essentially delegate to one that's complete so we can put on just the customizations that we want. And the first thing that we're going to do is to switch between light and dark modes. And to do this, we need to record which variant um, is being requested. So if we make a record of that in our editable theme, what we could do essentially is to sort of um, force override. So instead of using the system preference or the application preference, it will use specifically the variant that is configured in our theme. Um, we'll just make a... Um, short constructor function as well. This will become um, quite useful, but uh, for now we'll just set up the new editable theme. Um, and basically we're just going to uh, return an instance of the type, uh, but we do need to initialize this fallback theme uh, we can use the uh, default theme from the main find package for now. That's not a problem at all. And we can also specify the default variant. Um, 
We're going to go with the light variant because that's what matches our user interface at the moment. So that has set up the editable theme. That's pretty, pretty simple. Um, but next we want it to actually uh, return the color that we have um, selected. But at the moment it's just going to delegate to the theme that we're wrapping. So to do that, we need to override the, the color method. And if we just pop into the definition of theme once again, you'll see that color is returned from this function called color that takes the name of the color and the variant that is being requested. So we can override that um, by adding to our editable theme the appropriate function. And um, that is a find.theme color name and a find.theme variant. And if we save the color import, there we go, will appear. So instead of just delegating directly, we're going to slightly alter it. We need to know what name is uh, being asked for, but actually we don't care what variant is being requested because we're going to override it. And so we return the editable themes theme color by passing the name, but by passing the variant that we have stored. So now you can see how this theme is going to look up the color in the variant that we are currently requesting instead of the user preference. Okay, well that was that was straightforward so far. So before we before we go ahead um, and run this, we're going to want to hook this in, I suppose. So what I want to do is to use the start using the right hand panel. If you remember from very early on, we had this mock-up of a user interface and it has settings which we have put into our application and the theme selection was on the right hand side. Now I'm not going to get into navigation and theme switching right now, um, but we are going to go and start by putting a color picker in there. However, like I said before, we want to handle light and dark mode. Um, so we'll reuse this concept of a toggle at the top and go ahead and make that switcher. So to do this, we're going to need to um, pass information out of the editor constructor. In a future video, I'm going to come back to the definition of editors and tidy it up a little bit. At the moment, we're returning a canvas object and an error, which is okay, it fills the space. But because now we're going to need to hand back more, it's getting a little bit complicated. I will become even more so as we look at the concept of handling, saving, right states, whether uh, files have been modified. But for today, because I just want to work on the user interface side, we're going to return another canvas object from our lookups. And that will be the, um, the preview, not the preview, the um, palette, if we have anything to return. So I'm just going to insert that as a second parameter to each of these constructor functions and the same on our GUI editor. I'll come back to this one because we're going to do more, but for um, the others, it's just going to be nil all the time because if there was an error or if there wasn't, we are not too bothered about um, what has been what has been returned here. So we can just pass nil all the way through. And um, oh, we need to fix the prototype for the matched function as well. Um, and then return another nil in here. That should fix up those errors. And then from our graphical editor, we will return another nil in the error cases because there's not really anything sensible we can do. But here we can build a new palette. Um, and to do that, we're going to um, pass through information about what we're editing. So I suppose this 
this object is um, one of those things that's going to be important. Um, but that's probably it for now. So we're going to want to just create that function, um, make palette, uh, and that's the canvas object um, that we're going to be controlling the theme of, and that will return a canvas object. And we could just return a simple um, label for now. That has um, filled in the blanks. And you can see down here we have one build error remaining. And that is where we are setting up the user interface because we're ignoring this new return parameter. So we want to do something with this. If the palette was not nil, because most of the time we're still returning nil, we're going to want to um, append it to that right hand container. Uh, now, the right hand was um, set up, oh yeah, sorry, further up the file, wasn't it? Here we are. So that was just a panel that said settings before, which is, you know, a start. Uh, but let's let's make this a little bit more useful so that we can append items. So uh, it will be a container. Make, let's make it a new V box at the moment. We're not doing anything particularly smart with sizing, so it can just uh, stack down the way, um, and that will have the uh, header. Um, let's just call that right top, which is what that is there. The palette is now going to be the item in our right hand position. So we'll pass that there. But we're going to want to access it later as well. So let's just put that here into the um, struct that we have. And that will be a container. It could be a canvas object as well, but by referencing it as a container, we can append later without doing any um, typecasts. So we could actually um, specify that there as uh, g.palette instead of just palette. I'll fix these uh, references here. And then if we go down to where we had something to do with it, then we can simply say g.palette.add uh, palette that's been passed through. Now, this isn't particularly foolproof. If we open lots of files, it's just going to keep appending them. Um, but for now, that will be that will be just great. So we have the palette returned. I suppose at this point we could actually go and uh, run it and check that everything is wired together correctly. Um, and I'm going to just reference that example project. I think 3C was where we got to last week. And here we go, that's that's how we left the UI. And if I open this, we're seeing the GUI palette being appended there. Not a lot to see right now, but we've got everything wired together. So we can actually start applying this with a little bit of user interface and editing. So we'll go to our make palette here and try and do something a little bit smarter. Uh, so yes, like I said, we'll do the um, Toggle buttons, I suppose, is, is probably what we will need first. And they're going to toggle between a, um, a theme. So inside this palette, we can uh, encapsulate the theme that we're editing, new editable theme. And we're going to want to have um, the variant button. So variant is a um, container. Let's go with new grid um, with two columns and that will be the light and dark variants. And we will return a new, um, well, just VBox again, because we're just gonna be uh, itemizing these things. We could have just returned vari variants, um, but right now, uh, actually it's good to have it um, stuck to the top 
uh, which is the default for a VBox anyway. We could use a border container if we wanted to stretch the content, but this time it's just going to be stacked. Now the light and the dark buttons. There's no segmented control at this time, so we're going to make it using two different buttons. And when we press them, they're going to want to toggle the other, which puts us in a similar situation to a few videos ago, where one button wants to modify the other in its own callback. Um, and to avoid that potential reference loop, we define the buttons before they're created. Like that. So now we can set the buttons up. So the light button is a new button um, called light. And it has a function callback that is going to um, firstly set the variant of the theme dot light variant uh, variant light sorry we want to mark this button as primary so that is the importance um, is uh, high level importance and the dark button is uh, the regular importance which is medium uh, we will just need to refresh them as well because uh, we just modified the state manually. Uh, yeah. Um, so that has performed the set. It has made the change to our state, but we need to apply that this theme variant. So we're going to use that um, little hidden function that I mentioned earlier. Set preview theme. We know what we're modifying, that's the object that we passed in, and the theme is this editable theme that we're working on. So that should be the complete um, set of states to modify what's going on. And I'm just gonna copy this to dark as well. So we have both versions. That will be the dark variant. We will then switch these importances around and do the refresh. So that is the complete functionality of our buttons. Um, our theme is being set. We actually might be good to go. Let's have a look at how that works out. Here's the same example again, and I could have made the light default, I suppose. Um, but if we switch dark, then, the, oh, there we go. Yep, so we're getting the different color of text, but no, no background change because by default things are transparent and they fall to the background of the canvas, uh, which we're just, I guess, simulating here. So we can insert a background as well. Um, before we do that, let's just um, set that importance uh, to the high importance so that the light is default. And then when we construct our window content here, um, Let's um, let's add a background that we can control as well. Uh, so that would be canvas new rectangle uh, theme dot background color, and then the inner window will use a stack um, container new stack, and that is the background and the object that we deserialized. And that is what we're going to control here. Uh, yeah, I think that should be correct. So let's just, um, let's just try that again. And there we go. We are switching the entire content between light and dark mode based on a custom theme that we can now begin editing. So to do that, we're going to want to make our palette a lot more sophisticated, not just these two toggle buttons. So we're going to need to introduce a custom widget to do this, a color selection button, I suppose. Um, so let's give it a little bit of um, context. So we have our variant buttons and we're going to want to add a, uh, form like widget here that is a lot of um, different items grouped together. 
Um, so uh, we're not going to use a, a real um, form widget uh, because it's, it's a little bit more custom. Um, as you saw, we're going to want groupings, which we'd need to do uh, manually. So we could do a new container um, with a new form layout. We're going to want the grouping. Um, the top level one was brand. So we can make a, a header um, feeling piece of text using rich text. And we can just parse it from Markdown to save having to get into the API. Um, brand is the heading. And this is a form layout, so we um, group them in pairs. We don't want anything um, in on the right-hand side. So we could just pop a spacer in there. An empty label would work as well. Now, let's get into the first actual um, editing. So the first color we're going to work on. Well, let's look at the text color. Uh, that's, that's the thing that we saw first. Um, and that's going to be the uh, foreground widget, which we're going to need to create. Uh, let's just close that off there. Um, so that's sort of set up the form, but we're going to want uh, now to create this custom color picking button. So we'll uh, just call new uh, color button, I suppose. And that's the new type that we're going to make. Uh, it will need to know the type of color. Um, so that is the text color, uh, no, the name, sorry. Uh, color name foreground, I think is what it is. Um, and the button is going to want a uh, callback. Uh, yeah. When the color is picked, I think. Um, or actually, we could just um, we could just pass in the theme that it's editing. Um, yeah, pass in the theme, and then the callback could be uh, just regular function. Um, that's possibly easier. So we're going to go ahead and implement this. Uh, function, but first we need the type, the custom widget type that we're going to be creating. So we will create a color button as a structure. And I think let's just get started with something really simple. Let's make it a, a tappable rectangle with, um, with some color. So <clears throat> to do that, um, we just need something simple. Let's, uh, well, so to start making a custom widget, it's easiest if we just extend base widget. And then internally, we're going to have a rectangle for the color. Rectangle. And we are going to want to store the callback as well, which I think is just an empty function. So now we can implement our new color button. And that is going to take in what we passed. So the name is the uh, the name of the um, theme um, color theme color name. The theme parameter is our editable theme that we're going to be working on, and then the function is our little callback color button is the return. So here we do need to do one special thing. At the moment, custom buttons that use base widget, sorry, any custom widget that extends the base widget does need to call extend base widget. So we can create our new type, our new color button. Let's pointer that up and then extend base widget passing in itself is required. And that just tells the um, toolkit that this um, item that we've created is associated um, with the parameters we give it, the renderer, which we're about to create. And if you look here, the error is that we don't have a create renderer function. 
if we were extending an existing widget, it would because that has been defined already. But because we're building one uh, from scratch, we need to say how it's going to look. This is actually a lot simpler than it sounds. So if we make our um, color button have a create render, oh, a render function, which needs to return a widget renderer. That's the signature. Uh, color button. Why is that not happy? That's strange. Um, what have I messed up here? Ah, sorry, wrong place. Right, okay, so C is the name, pointer of color button is the type, and then we're going to just return a, a helper in the widget package, which is simple render. And simple render can be told any set of canvas objects that we want to create, um, to output, sorry, as our rendering. So we can tell it the color button's rectangle. That's just going to give it a colored rectangle. It's not got the, the numbers and the hex output that allows us to edit the number directly. But you know, we're, we're just getting started here one thing at a time. So that's creating a color button that has a rectangle as its output. So we need to um, create that rectangle, I suppose. Uh, so that would be a canvas new rectangle. And the um, color of that is easily got by asking the theme for the color with that name and the variant is the theme variant that we're being passed in. That will be ignored, honestly, because that's how our color function works. But it's good for completeness anyway. So the rectangle um, is currently that color. Uh, we're passing out uh, that it's going to be rendered with just that rectangle. So that would display, um, but we obviously wanted to do something. Um, so this color button is currently basically a rectangle, but we want to make it a tappable rectangle. So we can do just that um, by having the color button add the tapped function. Now this is a recognized extension point for fine. And to do that, uh, we need the complete signature of the method, um, which is that it has a point event passed in. If you're interested in all of the different things that you can um, extend, it's in the documentation, but also in the toolkit, there's a canvas object go right at the top that defines all of these standard extension points. Um, you would have secondary tapped, which is right click on a desktop or tap and hold on mobile, and there's dragged and all sorts of other things as well. But this is all we need right now. So when it is tapped, well, yeah, we don't need to know where it was tapped because it's just a flat rectangle. We're going to use the dialog package and use the excellent um, color picker. And that's going to allow us to um, have the user choose from a standard set of colors. Um, so that will be uh, well the title of this dialog, choose color, um, the message, something simple, I'm sure. Color, yeah. The callback function, that's what happens when we are passed back um, a chosen color. Uh, so that is uh, color.color. .color. We need to do something with it there. The parent, so because dialogs display inside a window, we're going to need to know which window it is. And this is where coming back to a more sophisticated editor um, type would allow us to pass the information around, but I don't want to get lost on that today. So what we can do, we can cheat a little bit. We know that there's a window, but we know there's only one window. So we can ask for the current app and the driver, which has a list of all windows. And because we know there's only one, we can reference it right here, index zero. So this is going to access our window but we will come back and fix that up later because that won't work if we have multiple windows open um, and it is technically possible to throw an error, though I can't think how that would happen right now. So we have now returned from a color picker. Um, if, uh, can C be nil? 
see yeah so they could have cancelled the dialogue just like they can with file dialogue so we'll do nothing there but if they have then we're going to want to actually do something with it we have an editable theme so let's just call set color we know the type of color because that is in our um, constructor ah but we haven't saved it really we want the name of the color and then that would be um, we want the variant as well yeah so the theme variant and then the color that has been selected I've got pretty bad naming here sorry it's over overloading um, so we're missing the theme and the theme color name in actually our, our widget here I, I didn't capture those earlier so let's let's add that um, name is a theme color name and the theme is the editable theme uh, trying to get better with my naming here so we'll pass them in with uh, name is n and theme is the editable theme so now we have the information and I'll just use these better names here and that should also have been the um, uh, the theme sorry yes we're setting the color on the theme and we did have a callback function here to say that the theme has been updated that's going to be important so we'll just call that callback function as well um, okay so we've got missing method here that's expected uh, oh I missed the return there okay so if we add set color um, to our editable theme we should be in a really good place editable theme so we have color editable theme set theme no sorry set color and oh yes yeah, so we're going to want quite a bit of um, information passed in here um, we're going to need the um, name and the variant that we're setting it for and the color um, which is a color dot color so with this being passed in we should be able to do something um, but we're going to need to store those colors in our theme okay so we're going to need the two palettes, the variants light and dark um, palettes. And for each of those, uh, we'll want a map of um, theme color name to the color. Uh, that, yeah, that should be it. And these are going to be our overrides. Um, so we will still use the existing embedded theme if uh, we don't have a matching type. Now. I'm not going to make the same mistake as last week and forget to initialize my maps. So let's just make that there. And again here, hopefully we can avoid uh, the crash that uh, happened last time. So now we can um, put the color into the appropriate storage. So if the theme variant equals um, theme dot variant light then we will want the e dot light map with that name to be set to that color otherwise we will set it to the dark so that should be our color stored now we need to actually look it up instead of just returning um, what was uh, the delegated themes color so again we'll say if this is the light um, we're going to look up the map and see if it exists and if it does return it so the color and an okay for if it was found is returned by e dot light indexed on that color name if it was okay return that color 
If not, um, we will fall back. So then, uh, just like below, we'll have an else. Um, that is the dark, sorry, yeah. I got distracted by this error here, sorry. It um, needs to be a named variable so that we can use it. Look up the light or look up the dark or fall back to the theme. Okay, so that has resolved the compile error in our GUI. We can now set the color. And we're calling this callback when the color has been changed. So let's just make sure that we're using that properly, which is this empty method here. So what do we want to do if the color has changed? Well, pretty simply, we're not changing the variant, but we're just going to want to set the preview theme again, which is going to trigger a complete refresh of our object. Well, that, that could be it. So let's have a look. Let's see what's going on. So if we go over to here, ah, yeah, we have our text color matches. And if we tap it, it brings up the simple color picker. We could change the text color to green and we're out of luck today. Oh, that's unfortunate. What did I miss? Um, in the tapped callback, we are mm, referencing something bad. Okay, so um, the function, the callback function. Oh dear, yes, I didn't set the callback function when it was passed in. It, I really hoped it might have said that variable's not used because it does in so many places and catches out silly errors like that. Tap the grape, turn it to green. Um, it happened, something happened, but it didn't take. Hmm, okay. So what's going on here? We've tapped our color. We have chosen the color there. Um, well, there's possibly two things, possibly more. Firstly, we didn't update our own state. So our rectangle should have the color set fill color should be set to the color and then we should refresh our rectangle. Now we're going to see that we've correctly picked the color and then we are setting the color on the theme. Let's just double check that. Um, we're definitely setting the color on the theme. The maps are here, we've initialized them and the color is looking up if it's okay, return it. If it's found, if it's found. The name is that name, the variant. Ah, I think we for, I forgot. I was distracted again. That is still something that wants to be ignored because we're overriding. So it's the variant of our theme, our editable themes variant that matters, not the one that is being requested by the app. So let's try that again. The green is updating our rectangle and it is updating our text. Hey, that's pretty cool. Um, now, if we switch to dark, this is going to update, but our preview here isn't. It's not supposed to be green. Let's try red. Well, it is red. That's gone red. Our theme is smart enough to know, but our button here isn't really getting the message. So what we're going to need to do is signal our custom widget here that the variant has changed and it should refresh what it is um, setting. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the code for editable theme. I should have been looking at the code for the GUI here, this color button. When it's tapped, everything is great. Um, when it's created, that's correct as well. But it is staying on screen when we change mode, when one of these buttons are pressed, we're going to want to do just a little bit more work to make sure that everything is updated. So how do we do that? Uh, good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we're going to want to put a callback function in our color buttons, essentially. So, uh, this is 
going to just be a little bit tedious because we're working on this button and we're going to just update that button. Obviously we will have a lot of color buttons and we'll want to update them all if this changes on some kind of loop. Um, but for now, we're just going to say um, to refresh this, we're going to set the variant um, to a dave dot variant. Yeah, do that there, and do that there, and that will, if we implement it correctly, cause our um, widget to refresh with the correct variant. And this is one of the nice things about custom widgets. They've encapsulated their state. We're not needing to pass around lots of objects um, or make massive um, lookups to be able to do uh, what is a behavior uh, change. So we can set variant here, uh, find.theme variant. Well, can't press buttons, it seems. Okay. So when that is set, we're going to want to update our um, variant. Now, how did this work here? Um, variant. Actually, we don't need. We don't need the variant. We didn't use it here. It's referenced in the invariant. So we could actually. Yeah, we could take no parameter here and just um, update. Yeah, that would work instead. So when we're updating, what do we need to do? We need to set the color of our canvas rectangle. And that was how we got the color before. Let's see if we can do that again. Fill color equals the theme. So that's c.theme. Oh, um, color is name and that is c dot theme dot variant and then refresh the um, button the rectangle we have just implemented essentially a slightly broader version of this here which is um, saying the color has been set then set it to that color we can look it up again so actually we can just completely reuse that um, update function now, when we update, um, the variant, we will update the foreground button. So let's just check out and see if that's working correctly. So the text color here, oh, well, you can already see it's working because the text color is different in the light and dark modes. We can set it to purple for light and, uh, a mid gray. Oh, that's far too dark for the dark mode. And there we go. That is updating appropriately. So let's just see if the flexibility of our color button is living up to expectations and add one more row to our form. Let's call this one background. And BG. This is where you'll see it can just get a little tedious, I suppose. Um, our BG button is a copy of FG with the background color name, passing in the same theme and doing the same um, refresh when it's tapped. The reason this is a callback function is just so we don't have to pass the object that our palette is manipulating all the way into a color button, which really doesn't care that we're refreshing external objects or, or updating our, a theme, I suppose. Um, and then the um, update needs to be called for that button as well. And this is, I might even write it here. Uh, we'll want to make some kind of loop that iterates through all of the, the buttons that we have in our form that are color buttons and call update on each of them. Well, that seemed like it was pretty straightforward. We've got our background color button, which is being updated uh, when the variant changes and it's applying the theme when it's actioned. 
let's have a look. Our background is white with a dark grey text. That's that seems right. Um, dark mode is a black background with light grey text. Yeah, so let's try a brown background and yellow text. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we might want our light mode to be um, black text with a orange background. I don't know whose branding that is, but there you go. You can see it's absolutely working. We've managed to toggle between themes and we can edit them. This is obviously going to just become a much bigger list of all of the different uh, named items of theme that we want to work with. So, well, that that, that was pretty that was pretty grand. Um, what what else should we be adding here? That's that's great. Let's why don't we see if we can also get that hex string next to the next to the color. Um, yeah, let's output it as a label for now, and then we could consider um, making that editable as well. So our color button is currently returning a rectangle, uh, sorry, it's currently drawing just a rectangle. Now, if this instead um, was, let's see, returning um, a rectangle and a label in a, a container, um, so we want the, the border, I think, is what we want, so that the um, top uh, rectangle would be on the left and the, and the text is filling the space. Um, so we don't have top, bottom. The left is the rectangle. We don't have a right and um, we have a label or, or text displaying to fill the rest. Uh, that's going to squash our rectangle down. So firstly, we'll just need to say there is a minimum size for our rectangle. Um, we could do this by building a custom layout, but in this case, we know that it's taking up a certain amount of space. The label is going to be a certain height. So um, we can make this a square size um, using the min height. What is the min height? That's another very good question. So we want some output text, and that's going to define the height of our custom button. So we can then use that as the square. So as well as the rectangle, we're going to want um, some text here, which is a label. We'll set that up. Um, so the text is new label, um, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a little color label. Um, we can get the minimum height by saying text.minsize.height. Oh, that was very helpful, thank you. Um, that's going to set up the new state or um, the new widgets or uh, objects inside our custom widget. We'll lay them out in this way. Now we just need to make sure that the text is updating when the color is set. Uh, so we set the rectangle color on the construction, so we should probably do the same here instead of our little text string. We're going to want to call a little a helper um, hex for color, I suppose is a good place to start. And we can reuse this color here um, and pass it in. Uh, that's our color. And we just need to implement that little helper function. Unit test alert, that would be a fantastic spot. <laughs> um, hex for color. Um, so we take in a color dot color, return a string, and that is, mm, okay, I'm going to just copy this little out of a text buffer I have for simplicity, because this is not always obvious. That is our color um, in a um, RGB model, actually an RGBA model which we'll grab over here as well. So we're getting the RGBA for this color, which could be any color space, and then we're formatting it with those uh, RGB values, assuming that alpha is 
FF. Um, and then when this updates, we're going to want to um, set the text of our label, set text, and that will be um, hex for color. Again, we're going to want to get the color, but in this case, we've just set it here. So we can, we can reference it in that way. I think that probably works. Okay, fingers crossed, and we'll see how this comes across. Oh, nah, I was just moving too fast there, sorry. Invalid memory, label, the label is nil. How did we manage to have a nil label passed into our border layout? So we have um, not set, oh, that's why, because the text was not actually set on our widget. Um, it needs to be passed in here, just like the rectangle. I hope these mistakes are useful to you. I feel a little bit embarrassed that I'm still managing to fluff things up like that, but it's uh, just off in the way, I suppose. Ah, so there we go. We now have the hex output for our colors. And if we change the background to yellow, that's updated there. Excellent. Now, because this is all tappable, if we tap that number, it is going to open the color picker. Possibly what we really want is to make that an editable area. But I think that that with the callback functions and um, needing to split it down into a tappable widget on the left and an entry widget on the right, it's just a little bit much for this video today. So I think I'm going to call it there. I hope you enjoyed seeing how we can make a live preview of a theme editor. I teased a little bit last time, but do join us in the next video if you would be interested in seeing how we can tidy some of this up by defining a better editor type with um, interfaces and probably the same for projects so that we can pass more solid um, types around and have a little bit less um, complex uh, bits of code in and out. And there's a couple of to-do items we can fix up by tidying things in that way. Don't forget please, that you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube for more videos and to see the very latest when they come out. If you would be interested um, in the product we're building as well, don't forget you can go to fission.app in your browser and you can see the latest updates on what's happening and you can even sign up um, to be a tester or just to get information for future videos. Have fun imagining what's possible and do shout out if you've got ideas for future videos. We've got plenty in store, but would love to direct it based on what you find most interesting. Thanks and have a great day.